Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Venture Wisdom. I'm Rakesh Bhatia, and uh, this is the place we talk everything venture capital and private equity. Today, we have come together to speak about the evolving landscape with digital assets, tokenization, and crypto in venture capital and private equity industry. And to discuss that, we have two amazing ladies who have been practicing this world for a while uh, and will be sharing their thoughts, their experiences, and their wisdom with us. Uh, please welcome uh, Noura Al-Barani. Uh, Noura is the Chief Compliance Officer at Arna Capital in, the, in ADGM. Uh, prior to uh, Arna Capital, uh, she was the uh, Compliance Officer and MLRO for Binance Abu Dhabi. And she was also the Global Head of Transaction Monitoring for Binance. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Noura. We also have with us uh, today uh, Dolly Ramaya. Um, Dolly uh, has spent about 17 years plus in the fintech payment finance industry. Uh, she is uh, the founding partner of uh, Tulium Venture Partners in UAE, a regulated fund manager, and perhaps one of the first few with a tokenized fund. Uh, she's also the founder of Trulium Venture Studio. Um, uh, based out of UAE. Uh, she's been into the fintech industry for a while. She was one of the founding team members at YAP. Um, YAP was the first independent digital banking platform in UAE, which expanded to several other geographies later. Uh, she was part of C3 card earlier, which was acquired by Eden Red. Uh, prior to that, she was with American Express in Muscat. Thank you so much, uh, Dolly and Noura, for joining us today. Uh, I'm so looking forward to this interesting conversation. I still rec uh, recollect some of the old stories uh, or memes or jokes, as they call it on the net, right? That, that a guy goes to a bookstore and says, I'm looking for a, crypt a book on crypto and blockchain. And the, the storekeeper says it's in the fiction section, right? But it's no more fiction. It's, it's real. We see it every day. Uh, there's so much happening on it. In fact, the happening reminds me, BlackRock announcing a fund that they, they have just filed with SEC uh, with securities for uh, that tokenized fund. I, I, I know it's not new. Uh, there are a lot of guys who have been doing it. KKR has been doing it. I know Braven Harvard has been doing it and now BlackRock as well. And I know, Dolly, you are getting into that as well. So we'll cover that uh, as we move forward. But then I'm very curious, uh, uh, just, just for the sake of audience, there's so many terms that float around in the digital asset as a wider term. How do we narrow it down for our users to understand what exactly is digital asset as we talk about today? So Nurai, who would you like to take a start on that? Sure. Um, so what's important to keep in mind is some jurisdictions have their own terminology that they have approved. Um, if you're looking at applying for an app, putting through an application for a regulated firm that's conducting some kind of activity on the blockchain, whether it's providing a token or a digital asset, it's important to ensure that what you're referring to, what you're interpreting as a digital asset or as a crypto asset is the same interpretation that the regulator has. Um, so, for example, um, out of the Abu Dhabi Global Markets, which is where I operate out of, we have virtual assets. And it's essentially a digital asset, but um, it can refer to several different underlying products. Um, and in return, if you're talking about a tokenized security, that would not fall under the remit of the regulator in the Abu Dhabi global market. So you have to be really discerning and very um, careful about how and what use, what terms that you use. So a digital asset, just looking at it, it represents an underlying asset that's, uh, that's basically digitized and traded on the blockchain, um, whether that would be a currency, uh, whether that would be um, a contract, whether that would be a tokenized real life asset. Again, you know, it really depends on what exactly the underlying product is before you actually look at the, at the, the use of the terminology. So Dolly, uh, I know that you are probably the first fund manager to be approved. Uh, to to do the tokenized fund management uh, in UAE. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakesh, and thank you for having me here. So it's scary to use the term first time, and I'm being very conscious of that. But it is true that under the regulator that we are with, the FSA, we've been permitted to issue security tokens as units of an underlying fund. 
which is a good start. It uh, allows us to put an otherwise traditional close-ended fund onto blockchain or tokenize the units. And yes, the the benefits or or, or large term, you know, long term benefits around tokenizing that unit or the underlying unit. There, there's there's a lot to discuss on that area, which I'm sure we will for the rest of this conversation. But it is it is exactly that that we something to add with what Nora explained. It is a digital representation of an otherwise real world asset. The asset in question being either fund in our case or a company's asset or company's cap table, which we can take and then, you know, convert into digital units or digital token units. And I'm sure many people, when we when they hear that you have uh, tokenized your fund, just want to hear a quick uh, thought on what was the motivation? See, uh, <laughs> okay, good point. The, the process of tokenization, and as much as we love the premise on which DLT blockchain tokenization has been built, which is you know the, around transferability, around permissionless, around trustless factor. Now, there are some goods and bads into this, and we wanted to connect that on an otherwise a very opaque, uh, you know, a, a very opaque, I guess, closed loop scenario of otherwise a closed ended fund. Uh, the reason primarily being that Putting something on blockchain, especially adding a permission layer on it, you know, adds a wider audience onto that ecosystem, which was the worst first benefit and the obvious benefit of anyone who's trying to put their asset onto onto blockchain or tokenizing it. The other one is obviously that when you have sorted the first part, which is you've eased the process of transferability, the issuance, and all the other uh, you know components around it it automatically moves into a more liquid nature, which is where the the initial, uh, I guess, you know, where we hear a lot of the benefits of tokenization, uh, which is liquidity and it, it, it drives more liquidity because it is including a wider audience. Otherwise, we're only dealing with digital assets or because we've spoken quite a lot about tokenization. Crypto funds have been around globally for, for a while now. Uh, the good thing that happened is the regulators here have really opened up and have been very welcoming about, you know, this whole exercise of permitting uh, entities like ourselves to issue security tokens. Uh, and, and that gives a little bit of confidence for us also to go and actually be able to do that and subsequently to the investors. Very cool. I think that's a, this this has always been a known benefit of being on the distributed ledger. The, the, the whole piece of single source of truth, transparency, ability to transfer wealth, uh, check the validity and everything, right? Um, uh, so, and obviously that is that is where the whole uh, rise of cryptocurrencies happened when right. it happened uh, several years ago. And I'm coming back to uh, Nura. Nura, the audience is largely the investors, not the retail investor per se, not, not a person like I or my colleagues or friends, but the institutional investors. Uh, the, the the funds and all. Um, what what do you think has actually brought their interest? One from the crypto investment side, and second from a larger digital asset arena. So, my understanding of of the benefits of the tokenized VC funds and PE in general is the access to liquidity. So I believe, you know, not just looking at the professional investors, the qualified investors of the world, but actually democratizing it and making it a lot more wider, wider, um, allowing uh, smaller groups of investors, investors who would have previously suffered from due to the high barriers of entry into the VC space to contribute um, to uh, the funding of VCs. Um, I think the attraction of the digital asset space has, as Dolly had mentioned, um, the fact that you know all of these contracts and uh, and are very transparent. You can see the fund's location on the blockchain. You can see um, the, the the various um, uh, wrappings behind those tokenized securities as well. They're visible. Um, you can see the ownership transfer. Um, and overall, you can monitor real time the size of the of the capital that has been raised. Um, and this is something that's important as well for venture capitalists to feel that 
they know um, the size of the funds, they know how successful the capital raising is, um, they, they can tell who owns what, I mean, not individually all the time, but they, in a sense, you can prove your own ownership um, of that VC fund at any point in time. Um, Overall, you know, the, the mystique behind digital assets is slowly starting to taper away as more and more regulators come into play and they start requesting uh, firms to, to demonstrate uh, due diligence, KYC, and demonstrate that they have um, various forms of, of penetration tests as well uh, performed on the uh, DLT technology that they use. So there is a level of comfort that's given to VCs, uh, to, to venture capitalists, where if they tokenize, if they have that digital asset, if they have that tokenized VC fund, um, they are able to prove ownership at any point in time, um, especially if it's a regulated venture capital fund, then they know that the underlying, um, uh, uh, the underlying um, fund managers won't run away with the funds and just disappear into the ether. So, there are several levels of assurance provided to venture capitalists and institutional venture capitalists or professional venture capitalists would understand the risks associated um, with this. But I think that the underlying premise of tokenizing VCs is to allow it, allow smaller investor groups and maybe those who previously wouldn't have been able to contribute uh, to the VC ecosystem to become part of it. So I think this is this is well established, and we all have agreed that uh, it brings a solid foundation of auditability. It brings a solid foundation of validating uh, the facts, uh, whether it's around KYC, whether it's around ownership, whether it's about anything else. But somehow, um, uh, even today, the the regulatory environment globally remains to be very uh, ambiguous, uh, in lack of the right word. Right. Uh, while I would want to come to that, I'm I'm still curious and going back to Dolly for a question. Do you see any um, a, a, any any impact, positive impact or negative impact, whatever it is, when you are doing fundraise for your own fund? It's it's a very large. I mean, it's a no straightforward answer to this. Benefits investors are seeing that, and this is purely coming from two factors. First is that they want to introduce themselves or an otherwise, you know, a very traditional way of investment and open themselves up to this whole entire exciting world of digital assets in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but they've been reluctant on multiple factors, the f technology, regulatory and the operational side of actually how to do that and what they need to do. Technology has obviously we, the way we are in today's time and age. You know that has become much easier. Uh, you know you, you work with platform providers, you work with regulated custodians, and that eases up the first part of the bit. The regulated part, or such investors working with companies or fund managers or any such asset providers who are working with the right set of regulators, gives them that added benefit or advantage or confidence that you know we're not just putting money into into crypto world blindly or, or or any of that nature. The third part is where we are seeing a bit of a challenge, right? So there is interest, but there isn't much know how uh, from how to actually execute such transactions. And as much as we have created or anyone in, in our place, whether there is a company who's re looking to raise, you know, tokenize their cap table or a fund manager, the investors are still finding a bit of a challenge from otherwise a very uh, you know institutionalized process of how to go about this. How would they create a wallet? What would happen if this happens? So that know-how is where you we are seeing that delayed adoption or lack of you know not not people jumping onto it. So does so it bring any extra work on your table to educate the investors on doing certain it, things certain way? Definitely does. Uh, but this is where what we signed up for or anyone who's trying to do has to keep in mind that it will require that additional work and effort to educate uh, and, and you know make them comfortable of what exactly they need to do. And it's sure. not just about comfortable, but also sometimes something as simple that if we are doing this, how are we going to book this on our audited financials? You know, what are the processes for that? How, how, what are we going to answer to our regulators or our other investors if they are institutional? So hmm. there is a very lengthy process of educating them or working with them and obviously us also learning from them. Uh, 
to 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 get the ecosystem more comfortable into you know entering onto the tokenization realm sure so i think that that goes back to uh, the same point of the compliance and taxation yeah. and other pieces and i go back to nura here come, what we just heard from dolly as well there are two two sides of the compliance one for the fund managers themselves and then the other part is for the lps how do they address the the, the their investments on on their compliances part we still hear that it's largely uh, evolving if not ambiguous to be a right word it's it's still an evolving environment from the regulation perspective globally uh perhaps uh, the geography that you operate in uh, largely uae has been far more aggressive uh, moving into it what do you see um, that is that is actually encouraging helping uh, both sides the fund managers as well as, as lps to consider the digital assets as an investment i'll just go back to what dolly was saying about the education piece so the education piece is not only applicable to the lps it's also applicable to the regulators so at many right. times we see that industry uh professionals and and those who are uh probably the most prominent business leaders in the communities uh form round tables and they involve the regulators in those round tables where they have open discussions about the challenges that they see their own personal professional space suffer when they're dealing with certain regulations and um to be honest most of the regulators in the gcc i would say uh, because of the interest and as you mentioned the aggressive nature of how they want to be be um um be seen by other uh, by foreign investors that they they do welcome technology so they've been very open and they've been willing to to discuss openly um their concerns um uh, and the what they foresee being the challenges for their own um implementation of rules and regulations that may actually be expected by supranationals you know by looking at for example the fatap and their expectations of you know what kind of controls have to be put in place for firms that deal with digital assets and um you know the uae just re was recently removed off of the gray list and that has an impact on on all of the regulations across industries but specifically when you look at digital to assets and the, the the nature of the technology and how fast that technology is moving versus how fast the regulation moves um i think you know from the basics of aml kyc etc those remain the same however the way that you go ahead and try to validate um kyc and perform your due diligence that is where the actual complication comes into place um mm -hmm. when when controls are put in place to kind of limit uh, uh access from other ge geographies outside of your regional scope where you are licensed for instance dolly that's uh, that's one of the challenges that we face so um you could see that there is trepidation there is concerns about liquidity so the nature of digital as the tokenization of of vcs for instance would allow for secondary markets to be put in place but a lot of regulators don't even know how to regulate secondary markets and that's what you need for liquidity you need that transfer you need to, that's how you create value in your firm as well um so there are several challenges and i don't think there's something that can be addressed overnight but um overall the more research that you do into the space the more that you see there should be collaboration amongst the regulators themselves as well um on whether it's a geographic level like in the UAE we've got the Abu Dhabi Global Markets we've got the Dubai International Financial Center we've got Vara who's also the the onshore regulator in Dubai we've got Eska which is the onshore regulator for across the rest of the Emirates so <clears throat> when you've got several regulators in a small geography as well it makes it difficult to kind of circumnavigate the the requirements and understanding exactly where you could go wrong as a VC fund that's trying to um offer your underlying assets in a digitized form um the technology i think you, you see more and more people having you know um crypto asset accounts like or digital wallets across the board um especially institutional investors and funny enough the majority of the um licensed entities operating out of the abu dhabi global market under the uh the 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 VA licenses are actually only offering their services to institutional clients so you see right. more and more of of the fund do come from professional or institutional clients which are the large you know um uh, the large uh, 
sharks, let's say. Um, so they're the ones with the funds, they're the ones with the liquidity. But you know, I think more importantly, the fact that there is restrictions on retail investors and um, um, whereas VCs would benefit from, from, ha from offering that to maybe high net worth individuals, not as high net worth as the definition of a qualified investor would be, but someone who's a little lower tier than that. Um, you could really benefit from those investors. I think it's it's still maturing. It's in the maturity stage. Um, and Dolly, you've you've probably experienced the most difficult <laughs> time um, when you were applying for your license. But I'm sure that you know over time you'll find a lot more people who are who are more experienced and educated about it and who are interested. Um, but yeah, it's it has to be a cooperative approach. And going back to your point, Rakesh, it's it's education again. You know that's the underlying. Um, topic, you know, education of whether it be the regulators, whether it be the general, the community, whether it be the LPs. Sticking to this point on education, I'm, I'm curious how open regulators are to consult with the industry. Are they actually consulting, talking to the <laughs> industry experts? Uh, uh, you can choose not to answer it, but then I'm still curious. No, to be honest, and I'll be very, very open. I have seen regulators in the region that have been very um, they, they want to listen to you, but they don't really give you much feedback. And there are others, such as uh, very knowingly, the ADGM, the, the FSRA has been very, very open. Um, I've been part of a lot of those uh, uh, discussions with the regulator where they were very happy to listen in and to we submitted official papers to them as well, and they've received formal feedback. So um, I think it, it really depends on how interested from a geographic, from a political, from an economic stance, the regulator is um, in the space. Um, but generally, um, we see the regulators in the GCC because of, of the amount of uh, the, the diversification drive that they have from a, a, a political agenda. Um, they're looking at ensuring that they have a lot of contribution in the fintech space, uh, digital assets. We see you know, countries like like Saudi even starting to look at various forms, you know, offer sandboxes to various forms of, of firms that want to operate off of the DLT. So I think, you know, most of the regulators are open, not all as much as others, but um, it really it really depends. So you really have to pick and choose the jurisdiction that you feel your idea best fits. So the same, same thing going back to Dolly. Uh, while you were going through the exercise of your approvals, and I know that you still have certain parts which are going through uh, the process. Uh, do you find areas and did you find areas which were still gray and were left to the interpretation rather than a, a solid line, black or white, that how it is supposed to be done? See, there, there were some components because we were going in and there was no precedence uh, as to how to go about it. This is just purely based on what the rule book says because they mm -hmm. had already put out the regulation. So uh, uh, the lot was on our end as well as to how we are interpreting, you know, the, the, what is written on on a, on a piece of legislation. So there was that certain components of gray, but I, you know, I must admit, even though lengthy from a time factor point of view, and there are too many factors that contribute to that, Overall, the reception or, you know, engaging in a dialogue or regulators being open to hear your side of why and what is the reason behind it, what, that was actually relatively smooth. See, regulators, by the very nature of it, are, are, are you know, risk identifiers. As long as you give them that enough comfort that we also have identified this and we're doing something to mitigate it or we intend to do something to mitigate it and we're top of it, we're not just being very blind towards it. And that's, that's, you know, relatively, they're quite comfortable with that. Uh, so, you know, and, and just to add to your previous question, what Nora answered that, you know, even in my experience, I did feel that they were very welcoming to understanding this concept of what's working, you know, what is the premise behind how this whole permission tokenization is built on, you know, how, how they can further go back and look into their risk books of how they are assessing risk for such forms. So that was actually a very uh, open dialogue and it is, it is, it still is. Uh, That's also good to hear that at least they are receptive of it. Well, I, I know that uh, there's always a thin line between listening and actually implementing and doing that. But I, uh, I think that's the nature of the beast. When you are a regulator, 
it's not just one aspect that you have to look at there are so many other things that you do from the uh, from the larger uh, picture perspective right uh, and as you rightly said uh, by nature regulators are discoverers when we talk about the tokenized equity right uh, the the line between the publicly traded companies and the private companies is blurring right how do regulators see that aspect because uh, by 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 the very nature the private companies uh, are not supposed to be trading no that is a, that is still something that regulators are not in in our region probably not, doesn't apply to us as fund managers but purely the concept of securitizing a asset of a company a private company is not something that regulators are very open to at least the current frameworks we have around us do not you know you cannot just have a private company uh plan to launch an sto and just you know uh, trade those those security tokens on an on an existing exchange there is a lot of process that will have to go you know for for you to be able to do that and a lot of different regulators and different regulatory components to be added uh, onto that so that's not going to happen i guess immediately this is something that we will see develop in time uh because there is sc or you know normally putting public uh, you know the whole process of putting an ipo out there taking your company onto the public segment is a very complex process it is whether you are doing it for a fraction of a company or whether you're putting the entire company on blockchain those rules will still have to be applied and sometimes it is not even feasible for companies to do that because you know might as well go into an ipo why would you just fractionalize because you will still have to entail the amount of cost the amount of regulatory work to be able to do that to secure the you know the investor protection your your stakeholder protection so sure. so that component of of securitizing assets of the company and putting it on a public market uh, be it for 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 security tokens is that component is going to take time to mature in in our region let's say so so both both of you made an important mention uh, here and that is the geography that you are in right so we are talking about uh, abu dhabi and dubai but then if we if if we generally have to just take a wider look uh, in other parts of the world from uh, your understanding your exposure um, which are the geographies which you should see are actually aggressively working on uh, on, on on this whole aspect of uh, either the fund tokenization or the crypto regulations or the other pieces that we just discussed so uh, nora would you quickly want to take that one and uh sure up to hear from dolly no why she picked the ifc as well sure i mean the traditional the traditional singapores of the world and hong kong and but also the us has made a lot of noise recently about um its concerns with, with crypto and it's being pushed by the uh, by the community as well to to kind of define the the rules and the regulations that are applicable to the wider digital asset space um you also see um countries like switzerland um that are very advanced in their regulation um you've seen crowdfunding happening in countries like egypt for instance and uh, other north african countries as well that are looking at crowdfunding and uh, you know funding fintechs uh whether through vcs or otherwise so i think i think there is no specific country that would that would claim to be the pioneer or claim to take the lead um there is value uh, especially for younger populations where you know technology is becoming a lot more important uh the platforms can be really huge and will require a lot of investment so there is a lot of space for for countries that have these th that demographic uh, that larger demographic like china and otherwise to to really look at what they allow and not allow and what they permit um but we've seen i mean there is no real there is no real jurisdiction that that i would say is is very aggressive but i'm very comfortable with the adgm with the fsra's approach um it has based itself on on some of the best and the leading regions and has taken that and done a 2.0 version of the rules and the regulations and is is, is always um in discussions and and is willing to to offer um an outlet for fintechs and vcs to come and speak to them but i would say you know there is no one leading ecosystem um it really comes down to the uh, the nature of the beast in, in in each jurisdiction and the regulator how they manage it as well yeah. 
So Dolly, what all jurisdiction did you consider and why did the why? So, so to, to add, because I was, or uh, for a firm, we were very sure we wanted to be domiciled within UA. We already have quite a few options like Noura has, has mentioned. Uh, but in, and, and in, in hindsight, most of them do replicate each other largely, right? But there are, there are all these small nuances to consider around it. So there was obviously ADGM and DIFC if you're doing a fund because these are primarily the two, two jurisdictions which allows you to become a, you know, a qualified fund manager or a regulated fund manager. So those are the two obvious choices. Now, our decision to go with uh, the former was not so much to do with tokenization as large, but more to do with our investment strategy, what we envisioned our VC fund to be, and, and whether being in Dubai made sense of being in Abu Dhabi. So it was more of our positioning of the firm largely uh, as opposed to tokenizing. The, the good part was that tokenization was the easier bit to decide because the security token regime that both both ADGM and DIFC have come out with are, are quite similar to each other, the, literally the, the mirror images of each other. So that's that would have been same either or. Uh, but the idea was morely to look at a broader ecosystem as a VC firm of what we are intending to invest into, and and hence being in Dubai made a lot more sense uh, while I was uh, you know going into uh, going into this decisioning. I must add though that because of the ambiguity and you have limitation of how many people you can speak to, and even though there's a large area of service providers that can take you in the right direction, the amount of reading I went through to read both the regulations and the law book. Probably wouldn't have done that since in school, but uh, but that was an interesting part because you still want to go and read in between the lines. What exactly do they mean, and have that kind of comfort for yourself? I hear that from both of you. Uh, why uh, why there is no one single straight choice to make from the jurisdiction's perspective, and why obviously I understand why you chose. Uh, your domicile for that matter, Dolly. If we have to put a few words each for uh, the regulator and for the fund managers who are considering this route, what what are those few uh, words of advice for both of these different stakeholders would be? I'll start with Dolly. <laughs> with regulators, I better not say what, what would be the word of uh, advice. I think they, even though they're very open and touch wood, they have been. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but but still, there is a, a quite wide variety of uh, you know a broader or a, or a different lens that they need to. They're still assessing it, but that they're, they're trying to tweak a very different world of digital assets, tokenization, blockchain, blockchain onto an existing list of parameters that work for an otherwise you know that we will take this and we will try to put it on an otherwise uh, you know risk framework now that would you know regulators would it would help us also or anyone in this for regulators to look at it that probably the existing framework of a of risk of compliance would not apply when we are putting things on blockchain or we are tokenizing something or for crypto in general so that could be something uh, which, which in hindsight will have to be, you know, taken into consideration by regulators. For today, it works. It allows for, you know, early entrance to go into the market. But it's like we're, we're trying to mold a, a new industry of blockchain and technology, a blockchain technology tokenization, and, and, and try to reshape it, which works best on a traditional, which actually beats the purpose of why, you know, why DLD, why blockchain was built in the first place or anything that we are building on top of blockchain. So that's where it will help to have those kind of, uh, you know, efforts being done by the regulators. On, and like I said, all, all the things that we've discussed so far, them speaking to more, uh, you know, more more ecosystem provider, different players into the ecosystem should allow for that. For fund managers, uh, again, know, know what your underlying theme is and decide based on that if, if you know, tokenizing the fund actually makes sense and why you're doing it. It is not as much as we love to talk about liquidity, just because something is tokenized, it does not automatically provide for liquidity. We love to talk about it, but it's that's not going to happen. Yeah. The market around secondary, the market around liquidity on security tokens is going to take many more years to, to mature and, you know, allow us. So that is, uh, you know, for fund managers, thinking of tokenization, they should. 
UA by large or this region is actually it has all the all the right necessary ingredients you would say if you want to come in domicile here but then globally like like Noura mentioned there are, there are quite a few that are opening up and they're very open to not only allowing issuance of of this kind of asset but also allowing this to be traded in a in a very regulated manner so so that's where fund managers should really Noura your thoughts um in terms of the fund managers, I would uh, second what Dolly had mentioned and say an advice to build credibility and trust with both the investors as well as the regulators. I think this is something that's very important. And once you have that in place and you have that rapport, um, it's, it's, it's unshakable. They will support you. They will allow you. They will listen to you. They will let you operate um, in a very uh, smooth environment. Um, but, you know, there has to be awareness. There has to be also understanding of the risks associated, not just because blockchain is is, is the hot new word and it's uh, it's what everybody else is doing. I should do it and jump on the bandwagon. It's more of, do I really need it? Does it improve or enhance my functionality? Does it really help me create that transparency and offer um, uh, due diligence and the legal framework as well surrounding the uh, the, the contract or the, or the underlying fund? Um, for the regulators, um, my my only point from both a practicing compliance uh, professional as well as someone who's worked on the other side in a crypto firm is um, they need a lot more um, probably having a panel, a side panel, advisory panel who are well versed with the technology and well versed with the risks associated and well versed with the benefits of having it to, to go back to. Uh, when there is an application coming through for a new technology or VC firm, they should go and discuss it with those professionals and those uh, those individuals who've, who've had that personal experience. A lot of regulators are slightly separated and slightly far away from the actual interworkings of the of the ecosystem so even though they are part of it they're an integral part of it but they may not be up to speed so to speak on the um on the advancements and maybe on the benefits uh on a new layer of technology that's coming through that's going to enable their own regulatory oversight so them use them themselves using that technology and being able to use all of the various uh tools out there to ensure that the vcs are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing with the with the funds that they've uh, collected uh, thank you so much, Noura, for sharing the details, uh, thoughts, experiences that you have had. Uh, I'm pretty sh pretty sure that our, our our listeners are left with nothing but more questions, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I know these questions are also, or the answers to these questions are also evolving. So we perhaps will see if we can regroup again in some time and see what has changed. But really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.